Well, today I'm very excited because we are jumping into a new sermon series that we're calling The Feels. Does anybody ever get the feels? You get feelings. Uh, some of us get really big feelings, and some of us it's just kind of, we're a little more, little more steady. Well, what we're going to do over the next month or so is uh, consider our emotions and consider what are we to do with our emotions? What does the Bible say about our emotions? And I really believe that this is going to be a, an incredibly helpful uh, season together as a church. So I'm just so looking forward uh, to this. I'll kick you off uh, with a little bit of a story. Sometimes uh, when my wife and I are driving and my phone uh, buzzes, if I'm driving, I'll ask her to, to respond for me and I'll dictate uh, what I'd like her to say. And so uh, years ago, my friend Ryan, some of you know Ryan, he's a pastor on the North Shore. Uh, he texted me and I wanted to respond while we're driving. And so uh, my wife grabbed the phone and uh, she responded to the text uh, accurately. Everything that I I dictated to her. Uh, And then later in the day, uh, I pull up my phone and I'm kind of scrolling through my messages and I'm reading back through uh, mine and Ryan's exchange. And I find that my wife, though she's very accurate in her transcription of my messages, I think it's muscle memory or something, but she completed one of our sentences with a wink emoticon. And so I, it had been hours, hours, guys. And so I had to call up Ryan and go, hey, Ryan, uh, moment of confession. Uh, my wife was texting. It was my words. She was texting. Did you know I would never wink at you, right? <laughs> like, that would never happen. <laughs> and to, to date ourselves, yes, it was an emoticon. So this is, we're old enough for pre-emoji texting. And uh, Fortunately, today we have emojis that we can text when words just don't cut it, right? And so I did a little research this week, and I looked up uh, the top emojis, the most frequently used emojis. And so see if you can guess them. Uh, With number three, this is the third most popular, most common used emoji. That guy right there, uh, he's formally called rolling on the floor laughing. See how he's rolling there? And then uh, the second most used emoji is this one right here. Anybody ever use this one? This is a, this is a very helpful one, I, I, I guess. This one is formally called loudly crying. This is loudly crying. And then drum roll for the most popular emoji of 2023 is when the data shows. And it's this one right here. Very, very well used one. This one is referred to as face with tears of joy. Do you know what your most frequently used emoji is? Does anybody know what you're most frequently? If you don't know, all you have to do is pull up your phone, go to your keyboard, go to the emoji, and it auto-generates your most frequently used emoji. And you can actually see, go go for it, Uh, you can see what your most commonly used emoji is. Mine uh, is the fist bump, and because I'm a pastor, my second one is prayer, of course. (laughs) But my most commonly used emoji that speaks to emotion is uh, its grimacing face. Do you know this one? This is where you, the teeth are right here. And I use that one uh, when I'm feeling a little anxious about something. Uh, and I also use it uh, when I'm experiencing secondhand embarrassment, which I don't know why, but I get secondhand embarrassment all the time. And so my wife and I might be in an environment where I can't say anything to her, but I'll just text her grimacing face like, this is really uncomfortable right now. And uh, I don't know. Uh, if you have a most commonly used emoji, but here's, here's the, the serious question I want to ask you, and that is, what is your most frequently experienced emotion as of late? If you were to think about the emotion that you just kind of have as a baseline right now, what, what is that for you? Is it anxiety? Is it sadness? If you're a Bostonian, is it annoyance? You're just annoyed with everybody on the road, right? (laughs) Is it it worry or or anger or frustration, insecurity, something else? I imagine you know what it is. And, and, And the first thing I want us to understand as we kick this series off is that emotions aren't bad. Like, you need to know that. Emotions aren't bad. I think some people see emotions as a bad thing. Have you ever heard or maybe said something like this yourself? I don't want to get emotional. 
Like I, you're trying to stay away from your emotions. I don't want to get a, emotional. And we're saying it as if emotions are something that need to always be avoided. And we, what we need to understand is that God created us in his image and likeness. And as we read through the scriptures, we see that he is an emotional being himself. And if we're made in his image, we likewise have emotions. When we see God take on human flesh, Jesus of Nazareth, we see that Jesus experiences a full range of of emotions. And I want to give you a sampling of just some of these emotions as I did a little research uh, this week. Just a sampling. First emotion that we, we, we will see Jesus have is we see him have joy. Uh, Jesus experiences joy specifically around uh, pleasing his Father in heaven. John chapter 15, uh, he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. So Jesus has joy and he wants us to experience his joy, and he's speaking to the joy that comes in walking in relationship and obedience with the Lord. Another one that Jesus experiences is exhaustion. He is exhausted uh, from the demands of ministry. I know some of you right now, you are exhausted. Well, Jesus has been there too. I love this section of scripture around Luke chapter 8 and 9. It's the, as far as I can tell, the busiest stretch of ministry for Jesus. And at one point he is so exhausted, you may know the story. The disciples are out in the middle of the sea in an open boat and Jesus is with them. And there's a storm that is coming upon the boat and it is raging so violently that they think they're going to die. And what is Jesus doing? He's sleeping. That's that serious exhaustion. Uh, he's, he's, he's asleep. Uh, another one he expresses is he does express anger uh, at the hypocrisy of uh, the abuse and the, the, just the, the, the haughtiness of religious people. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 33, he's angry at how the, the religious people of that day projected this, this false holiness. And he refers to them in his anger as snakes, as a brood of vipers bound for hell. I mean, he is very stern in his, his anger. Jesus experiences disgust uh, at the greed and the oppression of the poor and, and racism. In, in John chapter 2, uh, he goes into the temple, and you may know the story when he, he flips over tables and he takes a whip that he had to take time to cool down and take time to fashion the whip, and he goes in and he drives out the, the money changers because what they're doing is they're acting in racism towards non-Jews, towards Gentiles, and in the court of the Gentiles, they're inflating prices, and they're practicing money changing, and Jesus uh, is disgusted by that. Jesus also, we see, displays compassion uh, at, 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 at people who are wandering and, and, and hurting, uh, for people who are, are struggling with, with mental ailments and, and physical ailments, as, and some people are struggling as a result of their own sin, and Jesus has compassion for them. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd and who needs uh, care and, and, and guidance. Oh, we see Jesus experience frustration. He gets frustrated at people who have a lack of faith, who are, are slow in their learning. In Matthew 17 specifically, uh, he has people who have received plenty of signs, and yet they're asking for more signs. He says, you've had plenty. You should be able to believe, but they're just lacking faith, and Jesus is frustrated. We see Jesus experience and express sorrow at the, the death of his friend Lazarus and, and, and sorrow at the ravages of sin, that sin would cause death. And of course, you know the story of him weeping with Mary and Martha over his death. We know what he's going to do. He goes on and he raises Lazarus from the dead, but he pauses to enter into that and he shows for us that there is space in life for, for sorrow, that as you follow God, you will still experience Sorrow. We also see Jesus experiencing and expressing agony uh, just before going to the cross. You know the story of him, him praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's uh, so much experiencing agony. He's just in anguish that he actually sweats out drops of blood as to what's coming for him, the torture on the cross. And so that's just a sampling. We could, we could look at many other stories of Jesus experiencing emotions, but what I want you to see is he has a full range of emotions, and if Jesus does, then emotions are not bad. Emotions are not bad, but they can lead us to bad places. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Where your emotions lead you somewhere bad, whether right inside of your brain or lead you somewhere bad or to do something bad. But Jesus he experiences emotions, and yet his emotions never cause him to sin against God or to sin against other 
people. And we're going to spend more time on this thought in upcoming weeks through this series. But again, have you ever had your emotions lead you to a bad place? Maybe it was this week. It was this week for, for me. I had to seek forgiveness. But emotions can lead you somewhere good, and emotions can lead you somewhere where you really don't want to be. Anger can lead you to a place where you are pursuing justice for those who are oppressed and those who are marginalized. Or anger can also cause you to say things you wish you never said, do things that you regret. Anxiousness can, can lead you into to prayer. It can then drive you into security in the arms of a God who, who loves you and wants to be a father to you. It can, it can bring you to deeper places of prayer. Or anxiousness can just cause you to spiral. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you start to spiral with fear and, and panic, and it can just be crushing. So emotions, they're not bad, but they most certainly can lead you to, to bad places. And really quickly. So now let's go back to our, our original question. Does your heart have a default emotion? Kind of your baseline emotion, an emotional state that tends to most frequently describe where you're at in here and in here. Uh, an emotional state that you're swimming in often or hopefully not, but potentially drowning in. For the next few minutes together, what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk about what God wants for us to be our default emotion. He's okay with us experiencing a range of emotions, but God wants for us our default emotion to be joy. And so we're going to look at different emotions throughout this series, but today we just want to think for a little bit about joy. And so if you have a Bible, uh, I want to get to John chapter 16 for the, for the next portion of our, of our gathering. John chapter 16. And there's Bibles in front of you. Uh, if you would like, you can download the Charles River Church app, and there's a Bible on the bottom right so that you can have a Bible in your pocket at all times. In John chapter 16, John chapter 19 and 20 cover the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. But just a few days prior in John chapter 16, Jesus tells them that they are going to enter into a period of great sorrow, but that their sorrow will lead them to joy. A joy that they would not have known were it not for the sorrow. You know that some of the sorrow you're going through is going to lead to joy on the other side, but the joy would not be the same if it weren't for the sorrow. Heaven that we are awaiting and longing for would not be as amazing if it weren't for some of the stuff that we go through on this side of the grave. And so let's read our entire passage for today, John 16, beginning in verse 16. Jesus says, A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us, a little while, and you will see, not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me, and because I am going to the Father. And so they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, and so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you would not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, this is the truth, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she, is no, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until you, now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be Full. Do you believe that? That God wants your joy to be full. That's his desire for us. So here we are on one side of the cross. The disciples are still together with Jesus prior to his death, not knowing that in a few days we'll be on the other side of the cross and he will be gone. Some of you have lost someone close to you, and you know that experience when you're on this side 
just a few days later, and you just long for being back on that side. There's some things that you, you wish you had the chance to say. One last hug, one more, one more laugh together, telling them all that they, they, they meant to you. you. You know that experience. Well, that's where they're at right now, and yet they don't know it. They're, they're at a spot where uh, it's their, their last moments with Jesus, but Jesus knows it, and he tells them. He tells them, in a little while, you're not going to see me any longer. But then in a little while, you will see me speaking to his death on the cross. And then a few days, a little while, I will raise to life and you will, you will see me again. And the disciples in this, they're, they're puzzled uh, because Jesus isn't exactly speaking plainly. And he does this quite, quite often. He, he, he goes on, he says, you will weep and lament as though you lost. Some things in life, it's going to look as though you lost. It's going to look as though God lost. But God is so paradoxical in the way he works so often that even though it looks like he lost in the world won, actually he won in the world lost. The cross certainly looks like a loss. They killed him, it's over. Give it a few days, right? Your sorrow, your anguish, give it a few days. It might feel like you're losing, but God is actually winning. He is building something in you. Verse 20, your sorrow will turn to joy. Obviously speaking about the resurrection. And then he goes on and he gives this analogy. And his analogy is, sorrow is like a woman when she gives birth. That the pain and the sorrow will lead to something beautiful. Will lead to something beautiful. So beautiful that you almost forget the pain of going into labor. He's speaking of of the cross, right? You will have sorrow, but I will see you again. And at that point, your hearts will rejoice. And he's speaking to us now that we will see him again and he will make all the wrongs right, and we will have fullness of joy in his presence. Now, I think we all kind of understand the principle that Jesus is teaching here. You kind of get that, his illustration. I don't need to come up with a better illustration. It's just a a good illustration that difficulty can lead to joy, that no pain, no gain, right? You have to put more weight on the bar in order to get stronger, and so it's hard, but there's good things on the other side. Psalm 126 verse 5 uh, says this. It says, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy, using this agricultural picture, right? You sow, your tears fall to the ground, but you will have a harvest, shouts of joy. And again, I think we can understand this concept, but here's the question. Does that mean that all of life is just going to be this emotional pendulum, swinging hard one way and swinging hard the other day, just, other way, just, just full of these kind of drastic mood swings, sorrow to, 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 to joy, from despair to hope. For those of you who are, are thrill seekers, maybe you've uh, gone to an amusement park and you rode a roller coaster or some kind of crazy uh, ride where you had these moments of sheer and utter terror followed by moments of relief, followed by more terror, followed by relief. Or you have these moments where the, the G's are just pulling at you and then it's a ah. And then you get off the ride and you go, that was amazing. I thought I was going to die. And then I didn't. And then there's the people who didn't ride and they're waiting outside the gate for you. And they're like, why? (laughs) They're like, why? Anybody's the why person. Like, I I would rather just kind of have a, just a steady, I know what I'm in and uh, I'm going to miss out on some awesome, but I'm just going to hang out in the calm, right? I don't want to put myself, uh, I don't want to put myself through that. We know that this life is going to have trouble. And we also know that in this life, we're going, to have, we're going to have happiness. But it doesn't mean that we have to endure roller coaster emotions all the time. Like, yes, that's going to happen from time to time. But we can, instead of just having pendulum swings all the time, we can actually experience two things at the same time time. We can feel sad. We can feel hurt. We can have moments of anxiousness. We can feel annoyed while also having joy. It's, it's possible. We can experience the destruction caused by sin and all that we see on this earth, but also be happy and glad in God at the same time. It is, it is possible. The psalmist uh, gives us a principle that doesn't it feel very linear? I think, it, I think it does, right? Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Like first there's the tears, and then there's 
the reaping, right? There, there's the, the, the hard stuff, and then it's going to get good. It feels very linear. Another example of this is Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. It says, weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So there's weeping at night, and there's joy in the morning. Again, very, very linear. But later, after the cross and the resurrection, we get into the, the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul says, this he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. You see that that's not linear, is it? That's simultaneous, sorrowful and always rejoicing in the midst of sorrow. Uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, he says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance. And so again, not linear, but simultaneous. We can rejoice in our sufferings. Could it be that God intended us as New Testament Christians to have this new kind of experience on this side of the resurrection that the psalmist didn't have on the previous side of the resurrection. A few days before the cross, what does Jesus say to his disciples? John 16, 22, he says, I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one, no one will take your joy from you. On this side of the cross, it doesn't have to just be linear. Hang in there because eventually it's going to get better. Hang in there because joy is coming. On this side of the cross, because he lives, we can have joy in the midst of despair, in the midst of suffering. And your joy cannot be stolen from you. No one will steal your joy from you. He's speaking, by the way, directly to his apostles in the context who are going to go on and are going to be tortured for following Jesus. No one can steal your joy from you. So your joy doesn't have to be circumstantial. Sometimes we erupt into to rejoicing and it is circumstantial, but it doesn't have to be circumstantial. You can be tortured and still have joy. Why? Because Jesus died and he resurrected and he says, as I live, you also will live. And isn't that a marker of the Christian life? That's a marker of the Christian life. This unshakable, unstealable, unsnatchable joy. You got that little blue octagon placed right in front of your house. It says ADT. This place is robbery proof. Devil, you can't steal my joy. You can't take it. You can't take it. Because he lives, I live. And I have unstealable joy. And that's what the world needs to see, right? It's not all that shocking to them. When we have joy, when life is going well, that's, that's easy. What will cause them to scratch their head is when we have joy, when life is going really terrible, when life is hard, that's when they go, tell me about the reason for the hope that you have. Help me understand that. And you get to say, it's It's Jesus. God's desire for us is for our joy to not just be sequential, but simultaneous. Not just after, but in the middle of. Not just joy in the morning when suffering's over and the sun has come up, but joy in the dark. Do you have joy in the dark? Do you have joy in the the pain, joy, and the, the heartbreak because Jesus is alive. There's always reason for joy. Always reason for joy because our joy is something that is deep-seated within our soul. Now, back to our original question. What is your default emotion in this season? It might change. Or maybe not. Maybe you're all over the place. You're just emotional, generally. Blanket statement. But what is your default Emotion. Anger is your baseline. Grief, just in a steady state of, of fear or, or something else. God wants for us our baseline to be joy. 
but not just joy until the pendulum swings and we have another emotion, but joy throughout all of it, that it's this, this hum that's going on all the time. Joy is always there. Now, how do we get there? Here's how we get there. One word, rejoice. Rejoice. Kids, this is why you study your Latin. Am I right, Dr. Patrick? Re, the prefix, right, means again. It means back, right? Play it back again. Rehearse it again. Jesus is alive. Everything has changed. And again, rejoice. And again, rejoice. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And again, and again, and again. Rehearse the truth. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Now, please don't hear me say something that I am not saying. We believe that there are very real mental health issues. We believe that. God has made us, as humans, integrated beings. And so there can be chemical imbalances. And I'm not a mental health professional. I am a preacher of the gospel. In fact, you're all preachers of the gospel. We, we talk about the gospel all the time. And I know that gospel truth and mental health care are not mutually exclusive things. We need to understand that. We believe and we recommend people often, it's on our website, towards therapy. But the first place we go is to Jesus, not to our therapist. The first place we go is to the wonderful counselor, is who he is referred to as. Is he your first stop? Or do we go to all kinds of other places prior to going to, to Jesus? I'm also not simply reducing whatever you're going through in your, in your mind and with your emotions simply down to, hey, read your Bible, pray, and worship. And if that's not working for you, something's wrong in your soul. That's not what I'm saying. That's definitely not what I'm saying. But I'm saying is the starting point is rejoicing in the Lord. Again, rejoicing in the Lord. Again, rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And my prayer for us is that as we go through this series, that it will it will stir us as we think about what's going on in our mind, in our hearts, our emotions, that it'll, it'll push us into working through some stuff with our Bibles open, in prayer, in our, in our connection groups, because we got to do this with other people, uh, and, and maybe with a, a therapist, with a counselor, getting, getting help that you need. But it's, it's important for us to do the work to get the freedom that I know God intends for us. He intends for us to have freedom. I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the truth. Yesterday for me just felt sad all day. Felt sad. I, for whatever reason, yesterday, just more than I have recently, I've just been thinking a lot about my mom. Some of you guys know my mom passed away uh, in October. And uh, you know how grief, it just hits in unexpected moments. You're just not, you know, it's a smell. It's something, somebody says something, a joke somebody says. My mom would have laughed at that. But for whatever reason, I just woke up yesterday and it was just, it was just there. And it's just kind of been this steady uh, tone over uh, you know, even most days, if I'm being honest, since it happened. And uh, so yesterday I, I woke up and I spent time in, in prayer and tears started coming as I'm just thinking about my mom, thinking about the Lord. And, and I, it's hard to even explain it, but there was sadness. At the same time, there, there, was, there was joy. And I could tell you from experience that they can coexist. Again, yesterday, this wave of emotion that I just wasn't even expecting. And there were tears in my morning prayers, but there was also worship in my morning prayers. Simultaneous. Jesus, the one I'm drawing to, and we draw near to God for he'll draw near to you. Jesus lost, we know at least he lost his, his, his earthly father, Joseph. We know that he lost his cousin, John, the baptizer. So Jesus has been there, and, and drawing near to him, there's this, this sense of, you get it, God. You could have not entered into this mess, but you chose to enter into it. And so, God, God you get it. You, you understand. I, I found even in the midst of this kind of low hum of, of grief, I had really needed moments of laughter with my daughter that we just were joking and just being goofy around the house together. It was really needed. And they, 
It can coexist, right? It can coexist. I, I, I find myself rejoicing in the blessing of having such a great mom, right? And thank you, God, for that. I find myself rejoicing in the fact that, that my kids got to grow up most of their, their childhood with, with their Nina. And, and I, I consider that a, a great privilege. I, I find myself rejoicing and praising God for taking her when he did and not allowing her disease to progress to the place that we know uh, it would have progressed, which would have been really, really ugly and, and, and difficult. I, I find myself rejoicing knowing that death is not the end of the story. Knowing that right now, my daughter reminded me yesterday, she's like, Nina is in heaven dancing right now. <laughs> and we're going to do that too. And so they, they can coexist, right? They can coexist. And it's not just this and then that. It's you can have it right now. And so I wanted to open up our, our, our series, Considering Emotions, by just thinking on joy and reminding you as we, we start to get from the, the weeks ahead into some of the more um, traditionally understood negative emotions, that joy can be right there and should be right there. That is his intention for us, that no one can take your joy away. No one can take your joy away. It's always right there available for you. So let me close with just a few questions. Again, what emotion are you experiencing right now? That primary emotion, that baseline emotion. And what would it look like for that to be overlaid with the joy of the Lord is your strength? What would it look like for you to rejoice in the middle of that? That's what God would have you to do. You can, in the, the more positively associated emotions and in the more negatively associated emotions, all of them, your first place you go to is the Lord. The positive ones, it's, it's worship. The negative ones, it's casting your cares on him for he cares for you. We go straight to him first. So it leads to my next question, that is, what is your first stop with your emotions? What's your, your first stop with your emotions? Is your first stop a therapist? Is your first stop dumping it on a significant other? You're supposed to share that with them. Probably not your first stop. Your first stop is the Lord. Is your first stop uh, getting on your phone and, and sharing something about how angry you are on social media? Is your first stop complaining to a coworker about how awful this situation is? Is your first stop a substance? What's your first stop? If it's not the Lord, something is askew. There may be, and there should be, other places that we go along the way, but we start with the Lord. We cast our cares on him. He says, give me your burden, and I'll give you mine. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'll take it. He took it on himself on the cross. And so I don't know. Some of us right now, we need, to, we need to say to the Lord, God, first of all, I confess that I've been going to other places and not you first with whatever it is, whatever it is that I'm feeling. And in this room, there's a whole range, whether it's good or it's negative. Maybe you just need to confess to the Lord, Lord, help me to seek you first. Help me to give it to you first. And then let's pray and say, God, would you help me? to be a person who has joy, that your joy would be seen in all of my life, in the hard stuff especially, because that's the time when I have an opportunity, one, to find comfort, but two, to have a tremendous witness to the people around me who need to know joy and hope that's found in the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you right now thanking you for the chance to, to look at emotions in a way that may feel odd because we get to look at emotions before a God who knows it well, a God who has entered into the, just the worst of human despair. And so thank you for that. Lord, may we look to you first. God, I pray that if there's anybody in this place right now who has never looked to Jesus initially, the very first time, in faith, and trusted Jesus' perfect life, his undeserved death, and his resurrection for them, 
to pay the price for their sin. Lord, I pray that they would do that and that they would enter into this relationship with Christ that is available to them by faith. And then they would walk hand in hand with the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Bring people into your family right now. Ignite faith in their hearts. For the rest of us, Lord, whatever it is we're dealing with, I know we are dealing with stuff. We're always dealing with stuff. Lord, thank you that you walk with us and help us to be increasingly aware of who you are and the kind of relationship you want with us. Relationship of drawing near and communing and, and knowing your voice and experiencing your joy in hardship and when life is light. So God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you entered into this. So we worship you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.